Good afternoon. We are heading into the last session. This is a topic that's come up across the conference. JR spoke about it in the keynote. It's about capacity planning and applying FinOps principles to it. Uh, on Meta's private cloud, I'd like to introduce on the stage Amit and Deepak from Meta. Good afternoon, everyone. How is everyone doing? So uh, we are excited to present Meta's uh, FinOps capacity journey. And uh, we'd like to start with some introductions. So I'm Amit Mukherjee. I'm a product manager in the infrastructure team at Meta, where we build and operate one of the largest private cloud platforms in the world. Over to you, Deepak. Thank you, Amit. Uh, first of all, great to see all of you here. Um, my name is Deepak. I'm a product manager at Meta. I work in our monetization advertising team, and I focus on infrastructure there. And uh, apart from infrastructure, I also work on machine learning, AIML, ranking. Um, in many ways, what we do, uh, we are a customer of the central infrastructure, uh, private cloud, basically, that uh, Amit and his team built. Uh, we are very close to the application. We understand how we're running those, what is the return on those investment, and we'll talk about those. Um, Amit, one of the interesting things about, uh, you know, when I joined Meta, I joined from Lyft, which was cloud native, right? So it was AWS and GCP. Before that, I worked in Google yeah. on, and in GCP. So I, was, I came from public cloud background. Yeah. When I came to Meta, right, you know, Meta is all private cloud. So yeah. we build our own data centers and because of that, we have our own opportunities and challenges. Why don't you tell us about what drove the decision and what drives the strategy yeah. of having our own data centers, yeah. building this yeah. private cloud? Yeah, great question. And I've got this question a lot, like walking here. Like people say, Meta, what are you doing here? Right? Why are you in this conference? Why are you building a private cloud? And I think the, there are three really important things, right? Uh, in order to cost effectively serve our four billion plus monthly active users, this was really the only option to build our own private cloud. So we made a decision at a very early stage that, hey, this is the way we're going to do this. And it's actually proven, is pretty, uh, proven it, itself very pretty well. So what we do here is we optimize the private cloud for our workloads. So all those favorite applications, Instagram, WhatsApp, Facebook, they're really optimized for our workloads. So that's the way we can run it cost effectively. The other big benefit for us is privacy and security. Privacy is a very big part of our business. Uh, to think about it from the grounds up, having our private cloud uh, really helps. And the third part of it is we, are, we have the optionality to introduce specific custom hardware. So we are uh, also developing our own silicon. We recently announced our own inference uh, silicon for doing uh, inference that we're going to talk about later. Having that optionality along with all the vendor ecosystems that we have, that's really kind of the benefits that, that we get from, from the private cloud. So shall we get started then on our journey? Absolutely. OK. Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to kind of talk about what capacity planning uh, really looked like from the very inception of the company, like 2000 in early 2000s till 2022, right? So we have one of these big tenets in the company from one of the principles how we operate is moving fast, right? Uh, and that's uh, been one of the principles that really guided how the company operates. Uh, so if you look at like the way it works, it's like, hey, we build all our data centers from, from the bottom. So we build all the uh, platforms, compute platforms. We have our equivalent of Kubernetes. We have our storage platforms, equivalent of S3, our uh, data warehouse, equivalent of Snowflake and Spark systems that are widely out there. So we build this like one of the largest multi-tenant platforms in the world. And we have built this from the ground up. And it actually really kind of helped us kind of meet our goals. So, so what really, the way we kind of operated, like say till 2022, we made guesses, like work talking with this platform teams and the product teams on what they really need, right? 
and, and we did our best to kind of provide them that capacity. We also made some decisions because we had to really optimize for a particular set of workloads. Our fleet was very homogenous. There's a particular type of CPU, particular cores and configuration. We could buy a lot of them. Uh, we could have like really uh, favorable agreements of vendors, and we have really great predictability, right? So having those like uniform workloads, having a uniform like kind of homogeneous footprint, it really allows her to move fast, and it helped kind of drive the growth of the business. Uh, at that time, we were really not like, we knew, hey, at some point we need to understand about cost and attribution, but till 2022, that was not our goal. Uh, this was the right trade-off to make at that time, and it helped Meta become one of the most successful tech companies in the world. So then in 2023, uh, like we had gone through a hockeystick growth, and in 2023, we kind of transitioned into the next phase of our business, right? Which was like, instead of hockeystick growth, there's a more steady growth. And again, this was about 18 years since our inception. Uh, what changed there? Uh, still, we operated on the same principles of making products move fast, but along with that, we still had to do a bunch of other things. We really started kind of thinking about, hey, <clears throat> what, uh, we have to, what does it really cost to run Instagram, right? If I invest, say, $1 in Instagram, what is the value or benefit that we could get, right? Really, we started, had to figure out, we had to, what is the cost of doing the business? Uh, we also had to figure out how to do uh, metering the usage. We have all the product teams have budgets. What is the usage against that? And also kind of provide cost optionality options to our customers like Deepak, right? So he could like basically trade off like if you want, like, like if latency is not an issue, you can actually do with less capacity, right? Uh, if you are instead of five nines reliability, you're going to do three nines reliability, there is a capacity option over there. There's a trade-off option there. Surfacing those trade-off options uh, to our customers uh, became very important. And all of this, like all of this thinking, all this kind of change that was happening, it was really around ROI-driven decision-making, right? Really understanding the true cost of ownership and being able to put the resources in the place where we want to, uh, which is aligned with the uh, top-level priorities of the organization, right? So, Deepak, tell me a bit, like, how did your life change in 2023? Uh, very, very similar, I Amit. Mean, as you're mentioning, you know, Meta as a company went through this journey and evolution. Uh, same within monetization. You know, we have always been very much focused on creating impact for our customers, our advertisers, our users, uh, and for Meta. <clears throat> the change that happened was that we are still focused on all of those things, but we are also very much cognizant of what the cost of producing that impact is. So we really went from you know, uh, a place where if you had a great idea and any good idea that you had, we would have the capacity to implement it. But now we are living in a world where we are looking at them and understanding what the cost and footprint from a capacity perspective would be for all of those ideas if you have a new model to launch, for example. And we are really focused, have been really focused since 2023 on like measurement, uh, building the telemetry, building the tooling around uh, capacity, uh, as well as like for every decision that we make, measuring ROI, right? In summary, what I'm saying is FinOps, right? We have adopted FinOps, we have embraced FinOps. That's what really changed in 2023. And this is happening in, like a, in a complex um, infrastructural environment, right? You know, as Amit was pointing out, there's GPUs, uh, uh, you know, other than CPUs, there's like heterogeneous infrastructure. And it's a complex process to do this. And Amit, your team has built this process, you know, that helps us at, across Meta, across all the teams, to, um, you know, request capacity and get that, that, get that capacity fulfilled. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the evolution of that yeah. process itself yeah. took place? So with all this kind of transformations happening in the business, right, like really we had to really change the way we operated, right? And kind of the earlier phases where, hey, we made the best guesses of what capacity each team would need. Uh, we had to become much more disciplined about like capturing that information, right? So essentially kind of the ca capturing the capacity forecasting demand kind of moved from like an infrastructure kind of role 
to the product teams, like folks like uh, Deepak who are close in the, in the ads business itself, like they are kind of, they should be able to tell us, like they do the analysis and tell us, hey, this is exactly what we need, right? So uh, the way we kind of operate right now is we like work with the product team, they do their demand of all these different platforms that we are building. Um, there is a quarterly plan. All these demands are kind of put in together. There are finance at limits. And then these are reviewed at the highest level of the leadership level, right? Uh, the CEO kind of reviews that. And in that review, there are ROI trade-off decisions made. And out of that you know, decision making that happens like once a quarter, there is an approved plan. And then as the infrastructure team, like we, we kind of became like a private, you can think about a private cloud who is kind of serving the needs of our customers. And our, of course, all our customers are like within the company. And then what we do is we vend those resources, the things that were agreed upon, and we also meet doing the metering of the usage, right? So it's, it's actually a very, very big shift, right? Kind of the way we operated uh, earlier on from where we ended in, more discipline around really understanding true cost, being able to forecast, being able to take that and review that thing at a very top leadership level, and then kind of being able to do vent those resources in a, uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a timely manner to our customers. So uh, Deepak, like, what do you think about the process? How has it worked so far for you? Uh, I, mean, I mean, the process has been fantastic. I mean, the core things that have really worked well for us is like the transparency, first of all. This process is very transparent within Meta. It has the highest level of leadership visibility, uh, you know, as, uh, as you can see here. And then uh, the core thing here also is like it's ROI driven. So it's driven on metrics, it's driven on data that we have, it's driven on what will create the biggest impact, you know, for our users and for our customers and our advertisers. So we really uh, take that to heart. So that's number one. Uh, another thing, I mean, that works really well is like it's a, it's a, it's a good cadence. It's a quarterly cadence that we work with. Um, it's not that we have to put in a request for a capacity that we need like every week. That would be too much, but it's also not that we have to wait six months or a year. Uh, I mean, you know, things change fast at a place like Meta. So I think quarterly cadence is also a good cadence. Uh, also, you know, within quarterly cadence, we also have uh, ways to escalate, right? If we have needs for capacity because of some new workload that's coming, new investment area that comes up, or we want to uh, do certain things, there's always an escalation process that's always available to us as well. But I think overall, it's the process has been working really well with a very complex environment that we're working in. Okay, all right. So Can you, do you want to tell us a little bit about some of the salient features of some of the things that you have implemented? Yeah. Yes. So kind of let's get a little bit deeper on like what we actually do, right? And how it has kind of evolved over the last couple of years. Uh, so the way we now operate is we kind of built per contract, right? So when we kind of get uh, the leadership review done at a quarterly level, there is an agreed upon plan. And based on that, we place our orders in the supply chain. And that is what we commit to, uh, you know, to our customers. The second aspect is cost management, right? And, and that is very key, like true understanding of how it costs. And this is a, uh, you know, at the heart of the FinOps practice. Uh, and that, uh, in order to kind of do that, we had to instrument those huge platforms that I showed you earlier on uh, so that we can get that kind of cost attribution data. Like these are like really complex, one of the most complex multi-tenant platforms on the planet. We went about, we instrumented them, and we started kind of getting that rich data, that understanding of what it actually uh, means to kind of run, the, run our business, right? So, uh, for the first time, we were able to answer these questions, right? Hey, how much does it cost to run Instagram, right? How much does it cost to run Facebook? And, and really kind of understand and make kind of trade-off decision. The other aspect of it is metering usage, right? Like, hey, after the capacity kind of lands, like, hey, you've, you predicted this is the amount you needed, and hey, this is your usage. Like, having like good usage data at, at pretty low latency, that is actually one of the key things that we, we look for. Uh, 
I mean, so, the metering, metering usage sounds scary. It can be very scary to some of our engineers. Like, yeah. what happens, like, if my service is running over Coda, are you going to shut it down? <laughs> How does that work? Well, not really, but we should have a conversation if that happens, right? So you, you get first an alert, and then they say, okay, it's going to keep growing, growing up. You, like, uh, we have a discussion, and it's okay, this is something you're aware of, right? Uh, and, and that is kind of like one of the kind of transformations that kind of we have had as a, as a company is really kind of at a really at a developer level understanding of your usage and use that to guide your work. It's absolutely fine. You have like more work to do and you need capacity, but there is a, a way, there's a process that you need to kind of follow to kind of request that capacity, right? So, so that's, that's, I think that's the way we approach that. We are not doing throttling at this point and cutting things off. I, I, we don't believe in that aspect right now, but it's about really understanding and visibility. So uh, the other things that uh, also changed is earlier on, we, we talked about our fleet was homogeneous, but in the last couple of years, the workloads that we had to work with that has changed as well. So a lot of GPUs uh, came into the fleet. We are developing our custom hardware. They are actually into the, coming into the fleet. That made capacity planning extremely complex, right? The thing that was really streamlined with the one particular type of hardware, the kind of way we could run the process, that could not work anymore, right? So we really had to adapt our capacity planning to uh, adjust for the heterogeneous fleet that we really needed to provide. The other thing which we really doubled down was on automation. We developed these solvers, which allowed us to take all these different inputs, uh, the demand from the, our customers, like Deepak, uh, the cost of running a platform, the finance limits, the regional constraints, where we are going to deploy compute and storage and training, all this information. And there's a bunch of other like, you know, constraints that we have on the infrastructure side. So take all of that, and then from there, it kind of uh, emits out a plan of record. Like, hey, this is the kind of thing we could actually support in the infrastructure team, right? And that's actually one of, been one of the game changers for us, right? Being, having that ability to really very quickly change some inputs and do what if analysis, like, hey, if can we support this much more, right? What happens if we have this kind of GPUs in the mix and we trade off this less CPUs? Does it break the bank? Uh, is it even feasible? Can we land this capacity in this particular regions because there are some regionalization constraints? And being able to do that uh, at a software level, that was like truly transformational, right? That, that really was, was one of the big, big changes uh, that we made uh, in how we approach this problem. At the last part of like kind of how, uh, one of the things that we really started looking at more was like more predictable planning and ful fulfillment, right? Like really kind of having a very long-term view of hey, when to buy the land for the data centers? When do we actually put up the data centers? When do, when do we have the data center, we call this server ready, right? When we have the data center server ready and when can we actually start activating them, right? Uh, having that clear kind of understanding and uh, based on all the automation that we have built and it kind of gives out those plans for us uh, being able to do that. Now, this predictability is also very key for our supply chain. So our supply chain has a much easier way to kind of really understand like what is actually required. It actually helps them a lot. So, so those were kind of the you know, six, six aspects of, uh, you know, uh, FinOps capacity planning on how we kind of transformed uh, as a business. Yeah, I think this planning is really interesting because I think, you know, having worked in a cloud native company before Meta, you know, <coughs> when you need more capacity, maybe it's a two month, three month planning process. Yeah. And you, can, you get the capacity. Here we have to plan two years more, more than that in many cases in advance. So kudos to your team for doing all of that and bringing that capacity to Meta. Okay, thank you. I'm st happy to see that you're still smiling, and that means that you are, are you getting the capacity that you need? Maybe not all of it, but <laughs> I think we're, we're happy. I think we, 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 you're doing the best you can given okay. the circumstances. But, you, but again, you're making ROI de, uh, right. based decisions, right, yeah. based on whatever we can give you. Right. Okay. 
So um, what we could do, kind of talk about like all a use case of all these investments that we made in understanding of cost, understanding of attribution, and how it actually pays, paid off uh, with our, uh, the journey on generative AI. So sometime in 2023, uh, the company built out, uh, there was a big change in priorities and a deeper focus on AI. So we were, uh, the company priority was around building out, being the number one AI company in the world. And we as the infrastructure team were tasked to build that uh, infrastructure that's required, required for us to you know, be the leaders in the path of generative AI and on the path to become uh, for artificial general int intelligence. So uh, this was a very big kind of, uh, you know, ask of the infrastructure team. Uh, but what really paid off is all the investments that we had made in the past around really doing the trade-off analysis, doing the understanding of, like, true understanding of the cost, we are able to kind of figure out, like, hey, which data centers we have to empty, right, so that we can build those large GPU clusters, right? Uh, what kind of efficiency investments do we have to make for the non-AI services? Where do we move them? What are the regions we could kind of move them, right? Uh, we were able to do that in a matter of weeks, Earlier on, if, if this was something in 2022, it would have taken us nine to 12 months, right? It is such a complex kind of, you know, uh, exercise in there. So and one of the key things, like key takeaways from this talk, if there's one, is that FinOps actually helped us run better as a company. We were actually even moving even faster. Because of all these investments that we made, it actually helped us become even more nimble, like with this understanding of cost, understanding of trade-offs, understanding of ROIs, it helped us even move faster. So uh, one thing, like if we talked so far about uh, like the journey, about like how our capacity planning has evolved, but it is not only about like attributions and cost and under true understanding of cost, it is coupled with efficiency as well. And uh, so Deepak, why don't you tell us a bit about what efficiency means for you? Yeah, I think a couple of things to dive down deeper here. One is like efficiency and how focus on FinOps that leads to that focus on efficiency really breeds innovation and how it has uh, led to innovation in infrastructure and core engineering at a place like Meta. Um, you, just mention uh, GenAI as well. GenAI is an important area of investment for us, including in advertising and monetization. Uh, we recently announced a new tool for our advertisers that are driven by you know, generative AI, whether you have to write a creative for an ad or if you have to generate an image for, for an ad. All of that take a lot of resources. Um, and to run things in an innovative way, in a very efficient way, uh, the first thing that we are investing in is like, ROI-driven allocation, ROI-driven decision-making. Now, ROI is, we have spoken about this and heard about this in different uh, talks of the conference, so it seems like every, all the different teams, different companies are doing it. For us, the core focus has been on understanding the footprint and cost and attribution at the level of a workload. So for example, if you have a model, if I have a new model running or if I have a model that was running and I want to now launch a new version of that model, we have now build the capability to understand what footprint is allocated to that model, both from a perspective of inference and serving, but also from the perspective of training the data, also how much storage it will take. And in, in many cases, also understanding like how much, what network bandwidth it takes within the, uh, within the data center, for example. Understanding all of that is really, really important to be able to understand that capacity footprint. And it's very complex, right? Because also if you want to translate everything to, to dollars, like from megawatts, it's not the same, like GPU is very different than CPU, um, storage. So we have different, uh, you know, very heterogeneous fleet. And we think about ROI in a very, very detailed manner. And we make the decision on which workload and application and project to allocate, re allocate resource to based on this ROI, these ROI calculation. Um, so that's the, we, we spoke a little bit about the footprint on, of the uh, I, but also let's talk about the R. On the R part, like, we have monetization and ads, so we have fairly good understanding of revenue impact, but we also have a lot of models that drive quality, that drive responsibility and privacy, 
uh, that drive engagement. So we have to take all of those into account with like very clear metrics on how we are measuring the return of what we are actually investing in. So that is, that is a, a core aspect of how we measure efficiency, how we want to make sure that there's no regressions. Like some, a lot of times we'll have a good understanding of ROI and we'll allocate capacity to a particular um, workload. But over a period of time, the workload can actually become, uh, you know, can, ha can have regression. And we also want to be able to have tooling to monitor that. So we have been focusing on that as, that as well. Uh, another aspect of this is like we've been building elastic services. Uh, what that really means to me is like these services are really, really smart. For some reason, if Amit is able to give us all the capacity that we need, our services will run exactly as planned. But if he's giving us only 80% of the capacity, our services are smart and they can degrade gracefully in a manner that is optimal without causing any sevs, for example, no meltdown in the services. Um, also, uh, if he's able to somehow give us 120% of the capacity, he's able to give us more. Our services are smart, so they can run in a way that can actually produce more revenue, better impact for our customers and users. And I mean, an example of that would be, you know, anytime, let's say you are scrolling down on Instagram and we know that we can place an ad, uh, we can rank number of ads. We know that if we can rank 50 ads and give you the best through our predictive models versus if I can rank 100 models, or if I can rank 10 models, like it will all have different results um, in terms of the optimality. But given the capacity footprint that I have, if I can build these services in a smart way that they can react dynamically to how much capacity I have available, um, that's what we do. Uh, another aspect of the Elastic services is that if there is an Elastic pool of capacity that is now available to us through central infrastructure, where let's say there's a certain services who are not using that, we can again use those to generate impact. So we are building the infrastructure in a very opinionated manner. Also, resource utilization is really, really important. We want to make sure that everything that is now given to us uh, from central infrastructure, we're running them at like optimal utilization, as close to the right utilization. We don't want to run more than 80%, perhaps, but uh, we want it to run as much as high end utilization we want uh, that, that we can uh, without causing any troubles and saves and errors. And also, like automation, we have really invested in tooling and telemetry uh, across the board in understanding all of these things, footprints, um, hierarchy, taxonomy, have been some of the foundational elements, uh, areas that we have invested in recently. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll go a little bit more into some detailed example, uh, Amit. Um, like I said, innovation, one of the key things about FinOps that I have been really, really passionate about is like how it drives innovation. So here are a few examples uh, that I'll tell you about. Uh, whether it's adoption of a new technology, right, a new architecture like IP Next, whether it's about uh, the Epic Pathways architecture, whether it's about model deployment planner, anything that we build, now we are building with efficiency in mind and we are innovating on infrastructure to give us that impact. Here is an example I will share with you. Uh, this is a very high level architecture of IP Next, our next generation inference platform, and as you all know, like inference platform, especially the ones that are running at the scale like Meta, um, they require a lot of uh, resources, you know, again, across CPUs, GPUs, storage, and everything. Um, they require a very large amount of resources. And what we want to make sure is that many of these services are like load balanced, uh, and then they are actually farmed out to, to the servers. This whole deployment is actually very, very complex because there's, for a single request that you're sending, uh, when we are building replicas and we're building servers, they might actually have multiple models running on them. And each of the models will be running on multiple servers as well, right? So we can actually farm out the jobs and do it in a most efficient manner. This creates a situation, because of the complexity, where a load balancer, configuring the load balancer to do optimal work so it actually is filling up the work across all the servers in a perfect way is very, very, is very, very difficult. Um, also, all the requests are not equal. Many of the requests, depending on where they're coming from, regional imbalance and things like that can have uh, you know, di different requirements of amount of work that they have to do. So here is an example of we have not only invested in building and getting benefit from this next generation of inference platform, but we've also done it in a way that leads to utilization, that leads to efficiency and innovation there. So an example here, as you will see, is that if you have a deployment that is running servers at various different levels of utilization, and let's say you've configured it in a way that your top 5% uh, 
that are the most utilized or most constrained resources are the ones that are triggering auto scaling. That means you are now requesting for more servers. So I'll go to Amit to ask for more servers, and Amit will say like, hey, but you're not utilizing your servers here. <laughs> look, at, look at your uh, footprint. So what we're doing is like the core thing here is to reduce divergence and to make sure that all the things, uh, when loads come, all the services get filled up equally and they respond. So when I am requesting any auto scaling, you know, uh, when I'm requesting any more servers, it's based on P50. It's not based on P95, right? And, and, and I'm fine, and I, I'm, I don't, I'm actually, actually not seeing any errors on P95 because the, the load is so well balanced. So again, this load balancers have been around for, for a while, you know, uh, for a long time, but again, these things are just so complex that innovation is required in these areas uh, as well, and we have been investing in, in, uh, in, in that. Um, so that is an example that I wanted to share, but like across, across the board, um, it has unleashed uh, innovation, and one of the best ways it has unleashed the resources, uh, like innovation, is that now we understand what is the cost of doing something, and if I can come up with an idea for innovation and can measure the impact of that, that's actually now much easier to get approved by leadership to invest in. Um, so thank you again for all the investment that we have made, Amit, in terms of better measurement, um, focus on ROI. It has also helped us, from an engineering perspective, focus on the right things. Awesome. Um, also to do all of these things, it's really, really important to have standards. As we uh, spoke about, like, you know, we work in a private cloud environment. We do have some uh, footprint that is hybrid in nature and that is changing, changing with time. But we have really focused on developing these internal standards, uh, taxonomy, hierarchy, and building the foundation. Um, but Amit, you know, one of the things uh, when I saw your, your, you saw your badge, like you, you also had like a purple thing that said focus. Um, so tell us a little bit more. Like yeah. you know, we have invested in building all of these um, uh, standards internally. So everybody at Meta is not reinventing the wheel. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for guiding us through that. But also tell us about this, <clears throat> your involvement in this working group externally yeah. at Focus and yeah. how is that useful for us? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so I think I think. I've Almost everybody here knows there's so much kind of uh, buzz of, around focus here, but yeah, it's an open specification for cloud billing data, and uh, we got to uh, learn about it last year, uh, and it's been great partnership with Udham and his team, so, and also, you know, congratulations to them for taking it uh, all the way to 1.0. Uh, for us, uh, this is important, uh, and because uh, we are looking at the future, right? Uh, at some point, if we have to augment our private cloud with a, with a public cloud, we really need a way to rationalize and reason about cost in a uniform way, right? All these things that, all these investments that we are doing, like uh, if we have like different, you know, like public clouds kind of coming in, uh, it actually future proofs uh, that, uh, you know, uh, that investment. So that is kind of one of the key benefits that we have. And having this like open specification in place, uh, also we see that there will be some like analytics tools will be built around it and, and we can kind of benefit from that. And also uh, like uh, open source and open standards is in our DNA. Like we have played a very big role in uh, like starting from like contributions to the Linux kernel, to the React framework for, for UI, and now to Llama, right? So we, we've been very, very active in this, um, uh, in, in the open source community, and kind of it goes in rightly with, uh, you know, it's in our DNA, and kind of participating in the development of this open specification is, uh, makes a lot of sense. So at this point, yeah, we are looking at the development of that. We hope to bring our perspective of operating a public uh, of our private cloud into the development of this specification in the future. Okay. Yeah, so um, in, in conclusion, I would say that, you know, key things to take away here. Uh, one is that what we have also learned is like FinOps for, is for everyone, right? Whether you're running on public cloud where you're hybrid or where you have like a large public cloud uh, deployment like ours. FinOps is for everyone. It's really, really important. Um, it has helped Meta run better, right? Uh, initially, when we started facing, you know, things around how do we allocate capacity better uh, to the best workloads, 
it was a lot of work. It has been a lot of work, and I think this work will continue. But I think it, it has made us a better company in terms of, you know, of course, we had a year of efficiency uh, last year as well. But I think that this continued focus on FinOps has really made us a better company in putting our resources behind the best things uh, possible. Uh, two things that has helped spe us specifically has been, one has been around uh, an ROI-driven culture in everything that we do, uh, now if, including infrastructure. And then secondly, just unleashing innovation, like a lot of uh, you know, interest within Meta now to invest, continue to invest a lot more uh, in building the best infrastructure that is also very, very efficient and sustainable. Um, and then uh, last but not the least, uh, standards are really, really important. Like, Internally, when we do work at Meta across different teams, uh, it's really important for us to have a single set of standards and hierarchy, taxonomy, how we talk about uh, a project, how do we talk about a team, how do we talk about an organization, and understanding the footprint across them, across all of these heterogeneous infrastructure that we have. But now you can only imagine, like, you know, from, from, from that, is that how important it is to have those uh, standards across the board. So, uh, I would say like those are key takeaways uh, for me in conclusion. Okay. Thank you. That was the uh, ending of our presentation. So we will be outside after this, uh, and if you have any questions, we'll be happy to chat with you further. So thank you so much for your time here. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Check out more FinOps X 2024 content on our YouTube channel on the 2024 playlist. Support our channel by liking, subscribing, clicking the notification bell, and by leaving comments and questions for our speakers. We appreciate your support.